Dr. Sarah, I should introduce you, but I'm afraid I just met you so recently, you're gonna to have to introduce yourself. That's fine. First of all, I wanna thank you, Robert, and everybody who is present today uh, at this conference uh, for allowing me to, uh, to speak and, and uh, you know, be part of this uh, amazing panel. Uh, as to myself, I'm a longtime entrepreneur, um, medical doctor, in my background and also an investor based in Silicon Valley. I reside in Palo Alto. Uh, originally, I'm from Israel. Uh, founded uh, my first company at age 19. I had two exits in my background. Founded uh, an early stage fund uh, three years ago that, uh, that is called Gimel Entrepreneurs Fund that is based in Silicon Valley. So um, that's, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, and I'll be happy to dive in here with your permission and talk about the funding roadmap from design to deployment and production. And I chose uh, this slide, uh, this first slide to, as, uh, as it mentions, do something great because I think that in the overall, everybody here, um, you know, has the, let's say the incentive of, of doing something great, uh, unless uh, we wouldn't be here. So I wanna share this uh, second as a gratitude to everyone that is trying to improve and help the world in this current condition that we're in. So when we talk about a roadmap of funding, uh, it's really, you know, sometimes a peculiar uh, process because it really depends on what is the perspective that we look at uh, what we do um, from. That means where, what, what is our state of mind and what is that we are doing that contributes to what we are creating. So if I'm an engineer, a lot of times I would be prone to just start building it and without really thinking, down the road, um, you know, uh, of, of how this thing is gonna get funded and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if I'm a business person, a lot of times I would think down the road, you know, I, that I would need to uh, strategize it uh, uh, according to a, a certain plan and need. And why am I uh, stating this? Because I see it a lot of times as, as part of my work as an investor and with meeting with teams that are actually creating a, a, any sort of a product. So this is an, a high level overview of, of, a, of funding roadmap, uh, beginning from idea and team, market research. Uh, the third one is MVP and POC, which is minimally viable product and proof of con concept, traction. And of, of course, what, what does it mean to be capital ready. So let's start with the basics. So we've got an idea, now what? So a lot of times we think um, as entrepreneurs, we really love our ideas. It's really one of the things that define an entrepreneur, a fierce entrepreneur that I think I have the best thing out there. Nobody else has what I'm doing and I'm, I probably own uh, the entire market. I've, I've heard it so many times. So I think that one of the key factors is understanding that when you're building a product, you're actually not selling a product. You're selling a solution to a problem. And as part of that, we need to understand how to define and articulate that problem. And as part of that process to talk to the customer. One of the, if, if, if we're discussing ventilators and we know who is the person that is going to use ventilators, you have to talk to them from day one, even before sketching and drawing and starting to build things, because you need to understand perfectly how do they uh, will utilize the, the solution that you're creating. So, talking to people and validating your idea and researching your market and understanding your market very well will serve you a great deal, especially in the beginning. 
So we defined in, in our fund the three T's, which is the team, trust, and timing. And as you know, it takes a lot of effort to build a business and it takes a lot of effort to build a project and to scale it. So finding the right team or let's say gathering or pulling the right people together is one of the most crucial things because investors do not invest in, 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 in products and in ideas, they invest in people. So this is one of the things that I need you to bear in mind that when you pull a team, you need to have a well-balanced team. You need to be complementary and you need to know what you do not know because this could be very, very valuable. And, and that's why I created this slide of, of the must-haves. So a lot of times we see imbalance in teams. We see teams that are uh, more heavy on engineering and they lack the business side or they don't know how to seek funding um, or anything about uh, as it relates to, to scaling a product or fighting uh, strategic partners or, or whatever. They understand their own niche and they know how to build stuff. And, and, and this is great. It's great as long as you can pull it off because at some point your product must have some kind of a value proposition to the world and if that value proposition does not translate to dollars in a sense, that's going to be a problem. But having said that, since we are discussing today in an open source ventilator project, and a lot of this uh, work is done for nonprofit, as we know, I think that even in the nonprofit world, we need to understand where the dollars that uh, we want to or we need to get uh, as part of this project in order to scale it to areas that are distressed, for instance, such as the third world countries that cannot afford to pay the full price, for instance, for a, a ventilator as it, as it is priced in, in our market. We need to understand who are the key players? Who are the key players that will allow us to basically fund our process, fund our team and, and also subsidize the products for, um, for those countries. And I can give you an example. As part of, uh, in my background, I was an interim CEO for a little while in, uh, in a company that spun out of UC San Diego, Biomed Simulation. Uh, it was a company that created a patient simulation device uh, in order to train a surgeons and cardiac bypass, uh, uh, surgeons and perfusionists for cardiac bypass surgeries. So we realized very early on that we have a great need in third, third world countries for our device, especially in those areas where they don't have the abundance of uh, what we call resources. They don't have the, the, the personnel to train people accordingly. So we created a business model where we varied our pricing. That means we let the countries that can afford the device pay for those who cannot afford the device. And, and that was part of our strategy and that served us very, very, very well because we accomplished two things. One thing we accomplished the fact that we uh, made our numbers and the second thing we accomplished was we helped the world. And, and, and that's the thing that I want you to remember that the fact that you're doing something for nonprofit or that you're helping areas in distress does not mean that you cannot make a business out of it. You can make a business out of it as long as you create a win-win scenario for everyone. So as part of the business plan and having a clear vision and knowing your numbers, uh, this, is, this is exactly what I mean. When we talk about storytelling, it's very important to tell a compelling story, especially when you know that there is a competition out there. And as you know, having a competition out there is not a bad word. It validates your market. It means that if there are four or five or a hundred teams like you, that are pursuing the same thing, then you have a market probably because, because this is a validation that this solution is needed unless as, as many people wouldn't be working on it. So 
take it as a, as a, as a good point. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention about this, and, and as we talk about having an open, open source, when Robin and I discussed in the beginning, he mentioned, you know, Sarah, uh, when I started this, I realized there are over 100 uh, teams that are doing the same thing or they're working on the same project. And I was talking about the silos that we create today in the world of research and the way that uh, teams do not tend to collaborate, but rather, uh, let's say, isolate themselves from one another. So if I can make some kind of a suggestion or a call to action today is if we know that we have 100 teams that are working to solve the same problem, reach out to one another talk to one another, Be, you, you are much stronger together than separately. And this is the message that I wanna to convey today because the world is not made of a lot of silos. The world has become flatter and flatter because of the technology that we're creating today. If I'm in Palo Alto and I can talk today and, and be heard by uh, somebody sitting in Beijing or in Tel Aviv or in, uh, uh, France, in, in Paris, that means that we have crunched this space into a very narrow, let's say, a narrower uh, uh, um, domain of, of, of uh, let's say, maneuvering and, and doing things. And we need to use it for our benefit. And using it for our benefit is not uh, wasting resources, but rather consolidating, creating coalitions among teams. And this will push research and, and um, uh, all these solutions forward. And it will make uh, the health and medicine much more accessible and, and advanced than it is today. Believe me, if we only change our culture and mindset in research. So, uh, building a good foundation and not skipping steps. I want to talk about that, and especially since Christine, the previous uh, speaker, has mentioned how important it is to have uh, certain types of, uh, of um, um, what we call compliance, uh, uh, compliance uh, licenses, uh, or let's say make sure, make sure, making sure that everything is complied by the law as it relates to creating a, a ventilating device, of course, because this ventilator must be able to uh, do whatever it, it's needed and also make sure that it doesn't harm the patient in some way. So very early on, is, it's very good to square away all the legal stuff. And that means if you can have on, in your team or by your side or being consulted by somebody that understand this field very, very well and can place all the agreements, all the IP agreements, NDAs, everything that you need in order to be calm and able to move on with funding and also going through due diligence very calmly, I think this is one of the must-haves. Dr. Conforti, um, Chris Young from the audience would like to thank you for highlighting the real struggles of a multifaceted approach to humanitarianism with pragmatic pricing decisions. And I'm afraid I have to ask you to finish up in just two minutes, please. Yes, okay. So uh, as it relates to prot prototype, a lot of you here, I know that are in the phase of, uh, of, of prototyping. Um, this, these are the, the, it, this, this is just an outline of, of um, taking it to the next step. I will talk briefly about funding types. So we have two funding types which are the non-dilutive and dilutive. Uh, and they're very straightforward and I'm not gonna elude you and, and waste your time with this, but I really wanna talk about the non-dilutive uh, portion of, of the financing and talking about philanthropic funds and grants and, and also being able to uh, plug in into an ecosystem, uh, especially as a nonprofit startup. So being able to, co uh, to, to find and, and identify those key actors uh, that can help you move forward and, and align with your vision. Find those visionaries out there that actually can push your agenda and are aligned with the same agenda of, of what you're creating. 
uh, you'll be surprised that in a, in a lot of areas, uh, you'll find that uh, those people can actually be your check writers as well. There's a lot of donations done by uh, doctors and, and executives in, in those worlds. In early stage funding, I know that most of you here are uh, in, the, in the range of the less than 10 million. Uh, and I know that some of you here also have uh, approached uh, what we call the government funding, the federal uh, government funding. Uh, it's very important to know that the federal government has over $161.5 billion to deploy as part of their R&D budget. Okay. Um, and I'll be happy to share this uh, further if, if anybody Thank needs you, anything. Thank you, Sarah. It may, be that, um, it may be that in the Slack channels, uh, we, you can answer a few more questions. I'm afraid I have to give the floor now to um, Narayan Sandararajan, uh, who has written a book uh, about doing this kind of humanitarian work in the um, developing world, but I'm afraid I can't quite uh, uh, fully introduce him. But please go ahead and introduce yourself, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. A fantastic setup, um, Sarah, for, for some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about. So um, uh, quickly, my name is Narayan. Oops. Uh, are you guys able to uh, see my screen here? Oh, we can see. Yes, we can. OK, great. Let me do this. Um, so quickly, uh, just to introduce myself, I, I wear uh, a couple of hats. One is uh, as a CTO for a joint venture between uh, uh, Grameen and Intel, uh, Grameen Bank or Grameen Trust. Probably some of you know, or many of you probably know, was founded by Mohammed Yunus, who was a Nobel Prize winner. And Grameen Intel Social Business really is a social business uh, that actually develops technology solutions for, for the rural poor and the developing uh, world. Uh, second ad that I wear very decently is as a co-founder of um, a nonprofit called LifeMec that we just started as a response to the, 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 the COVID crisis uh, uh, with, with one of our first thing, first focus area being and developing open source ventilators, which is the topic for this discussion. So what I thought I'd do is essentially maybe um, take you through a couple of products or solutions as Sarah pointed out. Uh, uh, that were developed as part of Grameen Intel social business, and then end with uh, what we are doing on the op open source ventilator space um, uh, as, as the last part of the talk. So as Sarah pointed out, I think it's really, really important to uh, uh, really kind of understand what problem are we really trying to solve. Once we have clarity, that's about 60% of the uh, of the solution, I think, uh, and that's been our experience. So one of the first problems uh, we wanted to uh, tackle was in the healthcare space. Um, uh, it's a it, it, it's sobering statistic. Even now, about 800 to 1,000 women and die each year, uh, each each day. Sorry, um, uh, in, in in many parts of the world, right? Combined, right? Um, and there's 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 statistics out there on, on children dying during the first month of life. And it turns out that many of these are, uh, uh, can be uh, prevented by giving the right information at the right time. So that's one of the use cases or problem statements that we really wanted to solve, the right information at the right time. The second uh, um, problem that we were looking into is uh, many of these women and children were actually being exposed to uh, very bad indoor air pollution due to the fact that they actually uh, cook with wood charcoal, cow dung, um, you name it, very inefficient combustion, and that causes CO, CO exposure. And, and the numbers are staggering as, uh, there as well, approximately 4 million deaths annually there. So that's the real problem that we were going to go try to tackle. And the way we did it was, um, uh, devising a solution, which is this device that you're seeing here, which is, which is called COIL. Uh, it's carbon monoxide exposure limiter. It's also a bird uh, in, in, in South and South Asia. 
and that, that calls out and sings, right? So this is a spinoff of canaries, which warned uh, miners uh, of dangerous air. And what does this device do? It gives pregnancy and infant wellness audio tips twice a week, every week during the antenatal care period, right? Battery lasts for 10 months. And it also senses um, bad air around you. And the beauty of this is it provides local language audio alerts, audio and LED alerts, right? So that we kind of take care of the literacy problem if you're trying to do it over the, over the mobile phone. And the other thing that we really had to focus in on is making sure that it's, it's worn all the time. It's in person uh, for the pregnant mother. And so we really designed this as a, as a bracelet or a bangle that the uh, women wear 24 seven in, 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 in South and South Asia, many parts of Africa and Latin America, right? But this is, this is not how beautiful we started. So uh, to, 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 to make a point here, this was the engineer's bangle that we actually started out with. And you can see from the look on the uh, face of the woman wearing this saying, what the heck is this, right? I mean, why are you giving me this? It's fantastic technology, but I'm not gonna wear this, right? So the reason I'm pointing this out is it's really critical, um, not only to understand the problem statement, but as, as I think Sarah pointed out, to be in touch with end users, to be really in touch with the environment. So uh, our process was an initial prototype, which was this, and really go field trial this out in uh, countries like India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, and then come back and really design bangles that women can actually uh, wear, not just can wear, but really actually wanted to wear, where technology kind of slides to the backside uh, and it, it becomes part of, the, part of the process. So we had to go localize it for Bangladesh, which is an important uh, thread that you'll, you'll hear. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to develop a solution um, sitting, in the, sitting in the ivory towers of uh, the valley or somewhere else, but it's really important to make sure that one, it's scalable and localizable. And in this case, it was ethnically relevant designs, um, making sure that it's waterproof because women wear this, they take a bath, they wash clothes, they wash utensils. So we had to really make sure that it's waterproof and we had to make it dustproof uh, many, many different types. Um, so there's a ton of localization that goes on in making the product relevant or the solution relevant to the target segment that we are looking at. Um, so those are the messages that actually come out uh, played to the mother and um, it speaks like a uh, it speaks like a uh, friend to the mother so it really becomes a friend to the mother is the feedback that we have got I'll give you one more example here uh, in the space of agriculture uh, it turns out that 90% of the world's farmers don't actually test their soil and still apply uh, fertilizers. Uh, to, to make an analogy here, uh, it is like me taking medication uh, without knowing what I'm suffering from. That's literally what happens for about 90% of the farmers. And it's a triple whammy that if, uh, uh, if, if farmers do it. One, if they're not uh, applying the right uh, kind and the optimal amount of fertilizers, their productivity goes down, their cost goes up, and there's an environmental runoff. So that's the problem that we were tackling with this solution called Krishi, where we are really decentralized soil testing services. We, um, we really brought an expert in a box uh, that an entrepreneur can take field to field, plot to plot, farmer to farmer, and take their soil and test it for the right uh, lack of nutrients and provide the recommendation, much like uh, you get a blood test report um, at, the, at the end of your uh, blood, blood testing. And okay. So thank you, Narayan. I'm afraid I have to, um, I have to uh, ask you to just finish up in 30 seconds. Could you please? Absolutely. So that, that, that's the perfect timing here. So the latest approach we are doing here is, is a, in an art proper called LifeMag, where we are, uh, the problem statement is super clear to this audience, so I don't have to go to it. Uh, uh, we, have, we have come up with a couple of different designs, one collaborating the University of Florida um, effort. And there was a point made about really go collaborate. Uh, we do that uh, with this. The adapted ventilator system is a very close collaboration with the MIT design. 
the PanVent uh, system is a collaboration with the University of Florida. And both of those are actually going through FDA UA. And all of this material is going to be open source, completely uh, open to uh, open to use. The BOM, the EME BOM, the assembly instructions, every one of it so that it can on be used, but also localized in the context of, of um, in the context of, of the environment, uh, this needs to be deployed. Okay, and we're also kind of very humble about if this the, the, the need goes away, we're also looking at what the future might be holding in terms of non-availability of oxygen supplies, vaccine cold chain monitoring and other means. Okay, so, thank you very much.